this morning's study. And uh, we're going to continue on uh, finishing off Judges chapter 13. And then we'll look more into uh, Samson. But before we begin, can you join me in a word of prayer? <clears throat> Dear Father in heaven, we thank you for the study this morning. We just ask for your presence to be here. We are thankful for the time that we have uh, in the morning to study together. And uh, for these studies before the camp meeting, we ask, Lord, for your special blessing that you can help us uh, to sort through and clearly understand these messages so they can be presented uh, clearly to others in a simpler and condensed form. And Lord, we need your work in our hearts, most of all, that we can be like you in character. We can influence those that we meet. Be with us now through thy spirit, we pray and ask in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> Good morning again, everyone. Um, so we were uh, addressing Judges chapter 13, the last study that we had. Uh, it's been a few days because uh, we didn't have studies on Sunday and Monday mornings. And uh, um, we had uh, we had gotten to, I guess, uh, this this part about uh, Samson, that the spirit of the Lord began to move at him at times in the camp of Dan between Zorah and Ashtaol. Now we mark that as uh, between uh, the Lambert Church and. Uh, the school of the prophets, Zora being a bee or a hornet, but representing a bumblebee road. Now, I don't remember all of the details on how we looked at these. Um, and I never had time because I've been fairly busy uh, dealing with that. Um, other things, so I didn't have time to deal with this. So we know that 6881, the Hebrew uh dictionary number there um, is close to the number of days between November 9th and I'm trying to think it would be between September 11th 2001 and November 9th or is it July 18th July 18th so July 18th from November 9th or from September 11th 2001 to July 18, 2020 is 6,885 days. So this number is four days short. It would bring you to July 14th, 2020, if you counted. Um, now, so I haven't had time to review this. I've been busy. And uh, when we address that, um, I don't see anything on my charts. So how did we address that? Does anybody remember? Uh, I think Stephen had some insights into it, but he's not here this morning. I'd have to go and look at the video, I guess. Um, is there any thoughts on this at this point? So the idea of Zora and Eshtaal, what was the idea there? Anybody remember? I mean, other than that this is, does this refer to a period of time, yeah, I guess, is the question. I would believe yes. So because no. it, it's also a location, you know, it would be where Jeff lives. But uh, Okay, now. The situation that we have where you're referring to this from Judges 13.25. Yeah. Okay. The translators were making use of other parts of the scriptures. Now, 
where we have this, where it says in the camp of Dan, mm -hmm. the alternate Hebrew reading would be Mahatneh Dan. You you could pronounce that better than I. Uh, Mahne. Okay, Dan. And then they made use of Judges 18.12. Now, I find it interesting because 18.12, of course, was the name of the war that William Miller was in when he came to understand the providence of God and the leading of God. But that verse reads, And they went up and pitched in Kerjath Jerem in Judah. Wherefore, they called that place Mahanech Dan, Unto this day, behold, it is behind Kerjath Jerem. Now, yeah, we looked at that before. I don't remember everything about it, but yeah, go on. Okay, so my question with that, as we are considering all of this, um, what what's the important the importance of Kerjath Jerem? And why is it in front of this camp of Dan? Okay. And which which uh, which verse is that in? Judges eighteen twelve. Okay, Judges eighteen twelve. Yeah. Okay. So. So in that context, this is the situation. Where we have um, boy, that's the Danites take the Levite and the idol. That chapter, because the if I'm reading this correctly, and here again you can correct me if I'm wrong, this would be a plural of city of forests or city of towns. Okay. Um, so here it says, in those days, there was no king in Israel. And in those days, the tribe of the Danites sought them an inheritance to dwell in. For unto that day, all their inheritance had not fallen unto them among the tribes of Israel. And the children of Dan sent of their family five men from the coasts, men of valor, from Zorah and from Eshtal. So again, we have uh, Zorah and Eshtal, right, to spy out the land and to search it. And, and it says from Zorah and from Eshtal. Um, wouldn't that really mean between those two places? Well, it could. That's the beginning of the of the chapter. Yes. Right. I was looking strictly at the at the verse that the translators had had given reference to. Yeah, but I'm just saying here that we have in chapter 13, right at the end, it's it says between. The camp of Dan between Zora and Eshtal. Right. So, so the idea here, um, you know, we have this word nine nine six bane bane, which means between these two places. And so we've applied this as that area between Lambert Church and uh, the School of the Prophets, or I guess technically I should say the School of Prophets and um, Lambert Church, and um, uh, so Eshtaal, which means entreaty, uh, Zora, which means a uh, hornet, and I mean entreaty, I guess, could be a place of prayer, that's the church, um, but then when we look at chapter 18, we know this is an earlier history, but it's just I'm saying that it says from Zora and from Eshtaal, um, this would be, to me, um, and it's just this this word mim, this uh, 4480 that's in front of each of those. So it doesn't use the word between, but I think just the, it would just mean from between these areas. So not just from those two cities. So it, it's similar in a sense to saying between. But they're going to spy out the land. So they're going to come from these areas, spy out the land. Um, they come to this house of Micah, right? So 
and then they were by the house of Micah. They knew the voice of the young man, the Levite, and they turned in thither and said unto him, Who brought thee thither, and what makest thou in this place? And what hast thou here? Right. So we know that they're going to have this. Uh, he's operating as a priest. Um, yeah, so we went through this before. I'm just trying to remember, because when we went through this before, we talked about this verse, 1812. So there went from thence, out of the family of the Danites, out of Zorah and out of Eshtal, 600 men appointed with weapons of war. They went up and pitched in Kirjath Jerem in Judah, wherefore they called that place the camp of Dan, Manahan, Mahana, Dan, unto this day. Behold, it is behind Kirjath Jerem. And so when we had studied this before, we had made a comment about what that meant, but I don't remember because <coughs> that was a long time ago. So what is your thought on that then? Well, we're looking at this when when I was when I was taking a look at, at the portion that we were looking at here in Judges 13, that this was getting more specific because we know that from 1325, the Spirit of the Lord began to move on Samson mm -hmm. at times. And they're being very specific about this particular camp. Now, Judges 18.12 gives us even, even more specificity because this in Kirjath Jerem in Judah is about nine miles from Jerusalem, but it's up about the border that Judah had with Benjamin. Mm -hmm. So we had addressed the fact that the Danites had not taken possession of the land that was theirs by lot. Yes, they don't have a whole territory. They're just kind of scattered around. But it was because they had not had the faith mm -hmm. that they needed to take possession of the land. Mm -hmm. They were a faithless judge. Mm hmm so what application are you making then? Well, right now, are we exercising faith based upon what we have seen occurring since July 18th of 2020? And I'm speaking we as the movement as a total, as a whole. Well, I would say no. I mean, basically, there's no king, and every man does what's right in his own eyes. Right. So, are we between Zora and Eshtahal at this point? Is this applying to us right now? Yes. Um, I mean, and that's the thing about Samson. Um, because I mean, he, he's a symbol of Christ, but he does represent this movement at this time, right? If we're, if we're understanding this correctly about Samson. So out of all these lines, Samson's, of course, the arrival of the third angel's message in these lines. And, um, and he's not, uh, you know, he doesn't represent Christ morally, right? But he is victorious. And, right. and the way that we had him in the line of the judges is we had him as the January 11th, 2023 date. So it represents, but but this, this, this way mark being the arrival of the third angel, um, the end of the judge's line, so to speak, even though there's a fourth angel arriving April 5th, 2030. Um, 
this is the point in which Samson Samson is a reiteration of this entire line. That is, we're repeating our own line again, right, in this movement at the present time. And, and that we haven't really sorted out what that means. Um, so that's where we're, we're, we're struggling with this, which I don't think we're going to fully understand until the camp meeting, to be honest. Now, <clears throat> part, of, part of the rest of this, the, the translators also made reference to several other verses at the, very, at the outset of this particular verse, where they gave reference to Judges 3, verse 10, 1 Samuel 11, 6, and Matthew 4, 1. So Judges 3.10, and the Spirit of the Lord came upon him, and he judged Israel and went to war, and the Lord delivered Cushan Rishathiam, king of Mesopotamia, into his hand, and his hand prevailed against Cushran Rishathiam, however you pronounce that name. Yeah. And then 1 Samuel 11.6, and the Spirit of God came upon Saul when he heard these things, and his anger was kindled greatly. Yeah, so they're looking at the Spirit of God coming upon. That's only right. One. And of course, yeah. Matthew 4 1, and then Jesus was led up of the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. Now, as to Eshtahal, and Zora <clears throat> Joshua fifteen thirty three spells Zora differently. Um Zaria or Zoria, right? Right? Right. <clears throat> so we also have this in Judges 18.11. Yeah, but I think the spelling difference is just the King James, not the Hebrew. Okay. I'm not certain. Um, but I don't see that it's a different, different word. Because right. if I click on Zora... <laughs> There, it's going to have, uh, what were the verses? Judges? 15.33. Okay. No, Joshua 15.33, sorry. Yeah, yeah. So it's it's the same word in, in Hebrew. It's just spelled differently in the King James. But the significance there of Joshua 15.33, what did we attach to that? Well, we would have had 1,533 days. It's also another reference, again, to the 1335 that we find in, in Revelation. Yeah. And, and I think the main reference there, if we're going to apply it to our time, that's the 1533 days is from January 14th, 2017, uh, to March 27th, 2021. All right. right. That, that has to do with when Jeff first presented uh, Paneum at the pandemic, right? And and that's going to be, you know, 63 weeks after the end of the Levitical chiasm, that, that way mark in our line. So the 1533, um, uh, that it's connected here with this Eshtahal and Zaria, or Zora, I think we have to take as um, some symbol that's attaching this to this message. And it's the first occurrence in the Bible. It, so, so this is a reference to um, this movement, right, in this 
Joshua 15, 33. Right. Attaching that symbol to this movement. And, and I know it's the 13, um, 35 as well that's symbolized there. But the main, the primary uh, reference we, that where we first noticed this is, of course, the year of the Exodus. But then it became important when we recognized the number of days from August 11th, 1840 to October 22, 1844, that it's 1533 days. So that becomes an important symbol in understanding this uh, this symbol of Zora and Eshtal, that it's really this message um, uh, regarding this chronology, and that chronology is connected to 9-11. What do you think of the comment in the chat? Um, yeah, I was going to actually refer to some of these other ones earlier, but... Um, yeah, he's buried between Ashtaal and Zora, as had been Manoah. Surely we find rest in fulfilling God's mission, which entails dying to self. Um, well, obviously dying to self is important, but I don't think that that's what it's referring to here in this context of how we're addressing it on the line. Because the death of Samson and the death of Manoah, um, um, first off, I think we have to connect Manoah to the message of Jeff, right? I would think correct. And there is, in a sense, not that Jeff is dead, but a fulfilling of his mission. And, um, and that's where we're coming in this line of Samson, um, is that it's, it's a repeat of this history. So the message of Samson is the continuation of this message of Manoah. So it's the message of Jeff is continuing in this movement at the present time. But it still is connected to the message of Jeff, right? So we're not going to take, say that, like everything that we're teaching is still Jeff's message. It's still the message that God gave Jeff in that period, right? Because that's what it's all based on. Um, now, we also have in the lines, so here, I'm just gonna go to these lines, what I've done with them, because I have looked at them a bit, but uh, I'm just gonna move here. So here's Manoa's line. And, and now in this line, this goes, of course, We've addressed this in, in detail, right? That this is about the barrenness of the wife, but that this wife is going to have a son, right? So that Christ's character is going to be um, uh, presented, right? It's going to be uh, revealed in his people. And I ended up getting, just hang on here. Um, so we, this is leading to Samson's birth and we're going to have November 9th, 2019 to December 25th, 2021. I'm going to get rid of that question mark there. That's where we had ended that. But we also had this, uh, Samson's death and we had July 18, 2030. So, I mean, I put Samson's death there just because there's going to be a 40 years that Samson judges. And, and this whole line entails 40 years and 252 days. If this is correct of how we've applied this symbol, uh, taking 4495 minus 777 to get 3718, which re represents July 18, 2023 or 2030, I've placed that it's 2030, even though it does relate to 2023. That is, you can't separate what's happening now with 2030. And so we got these 777 days at the beginning and end. Um, could do this differently, but. Uh, 
so um, so to try to take what you know everyone's saying here, uh, to me there's a connection between uh, what I see is this connection between Jeff's message and what's being presented here. That is, you know, to be more specific or more straightforward is that <clears throat> we believe what Jeff taught was the truth. Like we don't, we haven't taken the position that Jeff was in error, right? Parts of this movement have taken the position that Jeff was just wrong. And then we have another part of this movement that has taken the position that Jeff was correct, um, but correct in the way that he understood everything, not correct in um, uh, because there's different ways of being correct. I know that sounds kind of philosophical, but we sometimes can be correct in what God has given us. We may not understand it fully. And, and it's pretty clear that Jeff didn't understand things that hadn't happened yet, right? Because we don't. And, you know, when we have Colin trying to say that Trump still has to become the president and bring in the Sunday law, which is what Jeff was saying, he would argue that he's he's holding to what Jeff was teaching and we're not, right? That we're saying, we're saying that that the Trump prediction was fulfilled. And Colin is saying that it wasn't fulfilled. Right? It's still, it's still in process of being fulfilled. We're saying no, it was fulfilled. And, and it's a very fundamental difference in how we're understanding both um, the symbols and how we apply them. Can we predict events? And um also how we understand fulfilled prophecy and how God reveals fulfilled prophecy. <clears throat> but I think the story of Samson clearly tells us that, uh, you know, especially with this Manoa and then, uh, you know, Samson's birth, the whole story leading up to Samson's birth and putting together this line that, um, This this period. Now we have 40 years and 252 days, right? So Samson rules is is judge for 40 years. Now, of course, this 40 years isn't beginning at Samson's birth or when <coughs> Samson becomes judge. Right. Um, where is this here? Um, actually, he judges 20 years. Part of me. So, um, yeah, so the 40 years is the period in which they're oppressed by the Philistines, right? And he's going to judge for 20 years. So I can't remember. I wish Stephen was here because I still don't fully understand this chronology of, of Samson. So he's going to be born... Um, during this time of Philistine oppression. And then the Philistine oppression is going to end when he becomes judge. But really, he doesn't end. Well, the, the Philistine oppression really doesn't, doesn't end until Samson dies. I mean, I don't, what I don't understand here, I guess. Yeah, let's look at this. Because, um, because he was uh, judging Israel, but they're still, in a sense, under Philistine oppression, even though he's their judges, their judge, right? And then it's going to say at the end, he judged Israel in the days of the Philistines 20 years. So that means the last 20 years of the Philistine oppression, he was the judge. Is That's what I think Stephen has said. Does that make sense to people? That the Philistine oppression, the 40 years of it, occurs during the 20 years of, of um, Samson being judge. Yeah. 
And he's going to be born uh, near the beginning of that Philistine oppression. Does anybody have a comment on that? Yeah, so that's what we, we said before. So if we're going to look at this line, so when I put this 40 years and 252 days on this chart, that is, we have this July 18, 2030 date. And of course, that's just because we're counting 40 years from November 9th, 1989 uh, to 40 years is going to bring us to November 9th, um, 2029, and then we have the 252 days that brings us to July 18th. So it's 40 years and 252 days. So I put Samson's death there. I don't know if that makes sense to people. This is just me working on my own, right? So whether that's the right thing to do or not. So any thought on that? So it doesn't mean that this lines up completely, you know, chronologically to 40 years that Samson is, that the Philistines are oppressing them. This is just, and this is the line of Manoah, remember, so this isn't actually Samson's line yet. We're going to have Samson's birth in there. And, and that, from the time of Samson's birth, if we're counting that as that period of 777 days, in our line, it's not like a specific way mark. It's that whole period of 777 days. I mean, and it's just nine years then from Samson's birth to Samson's death as a symbol. <clears throat> so these aren't, aren't like literal times meant to be taking the 40 years Philistine oppression literally in our time. Okay, so the idea that Angela has there is Christ proved that a person who has the mind of Christ can um, overcome their sinful human nature. And, and I would agree that Samson's death is, because what we see in Samson is, is somebody who's controlled by their passions. But in the end, he... He dies. Death to self occurs. Um, okay, I'm just reading one of Angela's earlier comments here. I don't know if I understand that comment. Hmm, I don't know. Um, so I guess the main thing that we have to take away from this is the message of Manoah is this message that came to Jeff. It's a message about what this movement is going to accomplish. Now, Jeff, as a person, really isn't represented there, but the message of Jeff is, and that is the wife is barren, the church is barren, the Seventh-day Adventist church is barren. Jeff gives a message or receives a message, really, rather, regarding um, the mission that the Adventist church is to accomplish, right? So it's a reform message. Jeff is a reformer. He's giving a message of reformation. And that message is given to him. And we always have to remember that in the sense that 
Just because a person is given a message doesn't mean he understands it. We can have lots of examples of this in the scripture where a message is given to a prophet, but the prophet doesn't necessarily understand the implications of that message. He may understand it in part. You know, for instance, Ezekiel is um, given a message about the destruction of Jerusalem. But he doesn't understand that this is also referring to the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD. Daniel is given messages regarding uh, the restoration of Israel. And he's looking for that temple to be built in his time, for the end of the captivity to occur is in his time. And he has a hard time understanding these long periods of time of 2300 years, right? Because he hasn't fully understood um, the implications of that. He doesn't know about all of the history of the world, but he's still given that message. And Jeff is given a message, and the message is correct. It's true. It's not error. Just because um, things don't happen the way that we expect doesn't mean that the message was not of God. And the way that we know it's of God is that it reveals to us our need of God, reveals to us our sinful nature, and, and helps us to, and gives us evidences that we can depend upon God further. So we know God is leading us because of the work that's being done in us. And we don't know all the implications of everything that we've studied and how it's going to unfold in history. We can just, all we can do is accept what God gives us, study it, and, and follow God's leading. So Jeff has this message. This is the message given to Manoah. But it's a message about something that's going to happen, that is Samson, right? This, this other message. And this message here is the message that we are presently in, right? Because we're saying that Matt... Samson in the lines of the judges is January 11th, 2023. And so this movement has moved from uh, you know, the message that Jeff was giving that he was given to um, a further understanding of that message in ways that Jeff couldn't have understood. And if Jeff could look at it now, I'm pretty sure he would understand it but I don't think he can look at it now, right? If, if that makes sense to people, what I'm talking about. You know, Jeff can't change history. He can't change the repetition of history because he's repeat, we're repeating Millerite history. So Jeff stands where Miller stood. That's why he's retired. Okay, so so that's the line of Manoa. Um, I'm sure there's a lot more here that we don't fully understand that that we will see as we move further into these studies. So now we're supposed to be going into the line of Samson, and with Samson. There's a lot of information, as we can see here. Now, the main line of Samson is this line that goes from 9-11 uh, all the way to December 25th, 2022, or, and January 11th, 2023. So that line, this is the waymark of the first day of the 10th month. So now when we look at Samson himself, it's going to cover this, this history of Manoah, but in a different way. Because this was all about the character of Christ being born in us, this woman that is barren. But the message that's given to do this is this present message. So if we're going to look at this line of Samson and we look at what the darkness is, we just took chapter 13, 1 to 23 and said, that's the darkness. But we zoomed into that darkness and we saw it was the line of Manoah. But in the line of Samson, what is the darkness? 
It's not just about a woman being bar barren because we're going to have a first message and a second message and then the arrival of the third. And we mark here um, very specific things in the line of Samson, 9-11, 11-9, and July 18, 2020. Remember, Jeff says that everything that he had studied brought us to July 18, 2020. That pro the proclamation of that message regarding July 18, 2020 was the culmination of Jeff's work. And he knew, no matter what occurs on that date, that his work was done, that FFA was no more, right? Because he understood the lines and he knew what those lines meant. And we know that when we have a message, that that message has to be accepted in order for a second message to be accepted. That is, if you don't accept the message of July 18, 2020, you can't receive the message that arrives on December 25th, 2021. So the question is, what particularly is the darkness in this line? Not just in a broad sense, but what particularly? Because if you think about Jeff's message, especially the message that arrives at 9-11, so we're going to address that message. It arrives at 9-11. There's a message. There's an increase of light from 9-11 to 11-9. Jeff's message is developing. And with 11-9, he then has this formalization of this message, which is the proclamation of July 18, 2020. So what is the darkness the misapprehensions that have come within the church. Okay. But this isn't about the church. I mean, it, it is, it's about the church's effect on this movement though. Right. Because this is started in 1989. And so which, this, I'm sorry, which darkness are you talking about? The Samson or Samson and Delilah? No, Samson, the line of Samson. We're not addressing Samson and Delilah yet. In the line of Samson, we have this darkness. Now, this darkness, we're, we're going to have in this line, this darkness precedes 9-11. Right? So this is about a darkness in this movement because this movement begins in 1989. So this darkness isn't the darkness of the barren church, the barren wife. This is the darkness that is exists before 9-11 in this movement. So 9-11 is the arrival of a message in this movement. So it's not about the church. Now, <clears throat> when we have 9-11 arrive, so it's not the message isn't understood yet, right? But we have a message arrive with the information that comes from what happens on September 11th, 2001. Jeff has been giving a message. He has been seeking to bring a message of reform to the Seventh-day Adventist Church, saying that the Seventh-day Adventist Church is repeating Millerite history. And we need to go back to the foundation and recognize uh, our history, Right understand our history so that we can go through a reformation. We need to restore the old paths. This is the message prior to 9-11. So what is the darkness that this movement has to um, address that's going to uh, arrive at 9-11 and be formalized at 11-9? Would it be, generally speaking, uh, doubt 
maybe doubt. <laughs> okay, well, we have doubt, but, but we have a darkness. So I, I don't know if doubt is the right, uh, the right idea here. I mean, I mean, we don't know. We don't understand our history. That was that was the message to nine eleven. But at nine eleven, a message comes, and it's going to culminate in this formalization at eleven nine. So if we think about eleven nine, eleven nine is we have the the 273 symbol, right? It's about the message to the Levites. Uh, but we also have this um, recognition of July 18, 2020. So by November 9th, 2019, this message, this movement is proclaiming a message of time. It's saying in 252 days, Nashville is going to be hit by a fireball. Right. So that message has has been developed and formalized by November 9th, 2019. So if that's the message, right, because a message addresses a particular darkness. Uh, one of the things we can say that the darkness is, is it's this belief that time is not a part of prophecy. That would seem to be the major thing. Right. So as Seventh-day Adventists, do we ever want to address time setting in the general sense? I mean, obviously, there is individuals who are misapplying time setting, right, which is going to continue to cause Adventists to be apprehensive about time setting. But we can say that Adventists aren't interested in time setting in a general sense. We don't because we're embarrassed of Millerite history. So we're, we're, we're not time setters, right? Now, it's true that we shouldn't be setting time for these events. But, but time exists. It's part of the watching and waiting. We have to measure the time because... You can't be watching and waiting without measuring time. Does that make sense? Yeah, it makes sense to me. Yeah, because we're looking at events. We're looking at, is Jesus coming? We're watching and waiting. And events are occurring, and those events are occurring in time. I mean, have you ever watched and waited without looking at your watch? Without being aware of the time? Now, there's the command of Ezekiel to measure the temple, and that's part of it, right? Because when we measure the temple, we see time is involved there. Or even looking at, or even not looking at the sun, the, you know, where it is in the sky. Yeah, you're going to be aware of time when you're watching and waiting, right? Yep. Okay. So we may not know what hour Christ will come, but that still doesn't stop that that, that doesn't stop us from being aware of the time that's being that's passing, right? We're aware of this time that's passing, and God has given us these symbols, these events that we place upon a line. That helps us to understand where we are, that Christ is closer, that the second gotta, coming is closer. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Theodore. Yeah. We got a we got an example of that in the Bible. If we're kind of like a bad example, but it's still an example. It's um where Saul, King Saul, he was waiting for Saint um for um uh, for um Samuel, Samuel to um to come, but he but he lost patience and didn't wait until he come and he sacrificed animals before he got there. Yeah, that's sort of example. Yeah, but the, and there's lots of other examples. I mean, watching and waiting is is a principle to me uh, that means we're aware of what's happening around us. 
for the, for the Adventists who just kind of, oh, we're just going to, um, I don't know what they're doing. Um, we don't know when Jesus is going to come back, so we're not going to do anything, right? They're not putting oil in their, their vessels. They're not trimming their lamps. They're just waiting around, but it will come upon them unawares, right? And we need to be aware when Christ comes. We need to be aware when the Sunday law happens. The Sunday law will just creep upon people. They'll be unprepared for it. Right. So, so we're in this process of watching and waiting. So if we look at these messages, the message that develops because of 9-11, I think we really come to understand the elements of time in that whole period, uh, 107 times 62 days. I have there. That's probably an inclusive count, I think. Um, yeah, that's that, that includes September 11th and conclude, includes November 9th. Uh, the cardinal count of that period is 6,633. And in um, the line of of Jephthah, we had shown that Jephthah is 3316, which is um, an exclusive count of that period if you double it. Anyway, <clears throat> so, um, and then from November 9th, you know, when we get to the line of, of Samson and Delilah, we'll see there's this 1260 days that occurs, which we're going to look at when we get to Samson and Delilah. Now, the verses that we used here, 9-11 is the birth of Samson, right? And then uh, 14 verse 5, we use that verse uh, to refer to 11-9. And that's going to be, then Samson went down and his father and his mother to Timnath and came to the vineyards of Timnath and behold, a young lion roared against him. Now, this Lion roaring, I mean, obviously it's more than just verse five, because the spirit of the Lord came mightily upon him and he rent him as he would have rent a kid and he had nothing in his hand, but he told not his father or his mother what he had done. And he went down and talked with the woman and she pleased Samson well. So the main focus here is this lion roaring, this young lion roaring. And we marked that at November 9th, 2019. So why did we do that? When we cause you have a cry or a war. Okay, well, we have a lion roaring. I don't know yeah. about a cry. Um, I don't think that was, we have this lion roaring. So why did we mark that verse as November 9th? If you remember how we how we did that. Now, notice we have September 11th connected to November 9th. Okay, so what, what is a roaring lion? What, what are the symbols here? Well, it'd be a message, wouldn't it? It'd be like a roaring, a message of some kind. Okay, well, yeah, but what's the symbol of the lion? Hmm. 
That could be Christ. Okay, so Christ. So does Christ... That could, that could, that could, be, that could yeah. be Satan, too. Well, yeah, but in this context... It's Christ, yeah. It's Christ, right? Yeah. We looked at the idea that, you know, could this be Satan? But uh, here, at 9-11, a mighty angel comes down, which is Christ. So we connect this to... Uh, um, Revelation chapter 18. Right. After these things, I saw another angel come down from heaven, having great power, and the earth was lightened with his glory. And he cried mightily with a strong voice, saying, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen, and has become the habitation of devils and the whole of every foul spirit and a cage of every unclean and hateful bird. For all nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication, and the kings of the earth have committed fornication with her, and the merchants of the earth are waxed rich through the abundance of her delicacies. Right. So we know that that's the Sunday law, right? On Ellen White's line, she applies Revelation 18 to the Sunday law. And we know that we apply this to 9-11, but we also know that 9-11 and 11-9 are the same way mark. So in this line of Samson, the formalization of this message is 11-9. Because the line arrives at 9-11. But it's the formalization of this message that's being marked here with the lion roaring. Does that make sense to people? That we, This is where we really started to understand the connection between 9-11 and 11-9 when we were looking at the, at the line of Samson. So here, this is we have it in this line, but we spent a lot of time establishing this. Okay. And then we have 14, verse 8 and 9. And after a time, he returned to take her, and she turned aside to see, and he, and he turned aside to see the carcass of the lion. And behold, there was a swarm of bees and honey in the carcass of the lion, right? So we have bees, which is Deborah. A honey, what does honey represent in this movement? You know, God's word or God truth. Yeah, it's a message that's eaten and is sweet in the mouth as honey and it's bitter in yeah. the belly. Right? So honey is 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 the sweetness of the message that we give, but it's also connected to a bitterness. We experienced the bitterness, Jim. Okay, now this honey is going to be in the carcass of the lion. The body, whether alive or dead, is a carcass. In this case, it's dead. Um, and he's going to eat this. Right? He took thereof in his hands, and it says he went on eating. Well, this is kind of weird. Um a dead uh, lion, right? What's that? Yeah, he said dead lion with honey. Yeah, honey. So, so he's going to eat this this honey out of the carcass of this lion, right? And and it says here in verse nine, so fourteen, verse nine, and he took thereof in his hands and went on eating. Now, uh, this is kind of weird because you have nineteen eighty. That's the Hebrew word halak. It means to go, right? To walk. It's often translated as walking, going. If you look at, um, if I click on this word, 
uh, went, go, walk, walked, walk, walketh, gone, goeth, walking, go. It's like our word go, right? We went, we go, we, he's gone, right? All of those things. He he walked, right? But it's doubled, right? This this verse or this word in this verse. He walked, walked, eating. So why is it doubled? Walk. You know, first off, why is it doubled in Hebrew? Why doesn't it just say he went eating? It wouldn't be a second angel's message, would it? Okay, but it's not the second angel's message in our line. But first in Hebrew, why are they doubling the word? I mean, he took there with, with his hands and he ate as he walked, right? And And also you're going to see he went on eating and came. The word came is exactly the same word, halak. So it's going to be repeated three times in this verse. Um, so in the Hebrew, it's going to say, um, uh, so when it, it used, and he went, um, uh, the halak, Velak ha halach. And then it's gonna say eating, that's just a call, right? So he he went, went, eating, and then it says he went. He went to, but we would translate it, he came to. He came to um uh, so if we look at it here, he came to his father right, and mother, and gave them, and they did eat. So, so first, we have this message of Samson. There's this honey in this carcass of this lion. So we know that that's, that's generally 9-11, but here it's also 11-9. And he's going he's gonna to walk or go, right? It's doubled, and he's going to be eating of this honey. And then he's going to the same word, go or came, right, went. He went to his father and mother. So who are the father and mother? And he's going to give to them and they eat. But he's not going to tell them that he had eaten of this honey out of the carcass of the lion or that he had taken this honey out of the carcass of the lion. So he's going to give them this honey, but he's not going to tell them where it came from. So what is this what is this representing in our movement? We already been through this so we should remember. Are you representing embarrassment? Um no. Cuz this is dealing with July 18 2020. <clears throat> Uh, it, it's sort of related to that, but because this is the this is the message. So, who is the father and mother? Well, the mother would represent the church, would it not? Well, it represents a church. A church. And a father would represent a kingly power, right? Um, yeah, generally it would represent, because it's a man, it could represent the state. But it could represent the leadership of the church, of this movement. So if this is honey and they're going to eat it, but they don't know that it came out of the carcass of the lion, what does that mean for this movement? Because did this movement, did the leadership and the movement eat of this honey of the message of Samson? 
Yes. Okay. So what does this represent then? It's a message, uh, a message. Of... Message of July 18th was very sweet as it was being given. The bitterness came upon us when we began to realize that personally we were not prepared to be okay. able to, to deal with what needed to be handled. Okay. Now, so he didn't tell them that it was taken out of the carcass of the lion. Right. So what does that mean? He didn't tell them that the message had come from Christ. Okay, well, but what is this carcass of the lion? Well, well I thought the carcass of the lion was unclean. Yes, I understand. It's, it's, you're correct, it's unclean. But that's just a moral... Um, you know, um, morally ironic aspect of this story. But in this car case, um, a carcass would refer to something that dies, right? Now, this is the carcass of the line. The line represents Christ. We know that this represents the Sunday law, that we can parallel this to the Sunday law, which is Revelation 18. Okay. Does, does the carcass of the lion figuratively represent uh, the ministry of FFA? Well, it does, right? Because FFA dies. Right? So we're, we're saying that this, this part here is in our lines. It's addressing uh, July 18th, right? So that's where we placed it on the line, whether it's correct or not, we don't know, but that's where we've placed it. And what we have understood is that uh, this message, people were looking at the sweet part of it, but they didn't understand where it came from, that this was a cross, right? And, and we know that, that the honey comes from bees, right? There's a swarm of bees and honey in the carcass of the lion. The bees represent the school of the prophets. <clears throat> right? That's how we've understood this, uh, this passage and, and these symbols here. So you got the swarm of bees, the bees is Deborah. That's the word for bees. And we have this honey. So we know that that's the school of prophets and this honey. But they don't know that it's the carcass of the lions. Right? And so this carcass has to do with a, a number of things. One is FFA has to end. Right? In order to that this honey is taken from the end of FFA. But it's also about the message of death to self, right? That there is a bitter experience that this message is to give us. So he's going to give this to his father and mother, but they don't know. They don't understand what this experience is, what this honey is where it comes from. So that, that's how we, we've taken this, this passage. So it's, it's marking the end of FFA. But, but the, the father and the mother don't know this. And so we're going to have this problem within this movement. Now, one of the things that we did with this story is we know that there's going to be this, uh, this whole story addressing um, uh, well, let's look on, on these verses here. So in verse 10, um, so his father went down unto the woman, and Samson made there a feast, for so used 
the young men to do. And it came to pass when they saw him that they brought him 30 companions to be with him. So we know there's this 30 companions. There's going to be this riddle, right? So he's going to use this story of the lion, July 18th. It's going to become a riddle. And Samson said unto them, I will now put forth a riddle unto you, if ye can certainly declare it me within the seven days of the feast and find it out. Then I will give you 30 sheets and 30 changes of garments, right? So the sheets here, of course, are referring to uh, like shirts. But if ye cannot declare it me, then ye shall give me 30 sheets or shirts and 30 changes of garments. And they said unto him, put forth thy riddle that we may hear it. And he said unto them, out of the eater came forth meat, and out of the strong came forth sweetness. And they could not, in three days, expound the riddle. Now, we put the three days as um, connected to the three days call in uh, Ezra. And so what we did with this line is we put this as December 25th, 2021. And we use the 30, 30, 30 also to give us this 252, 525. And so we put this at the end. And so the three days is that call to the 20th day of the ninth month. And then here we're going to have just symbolically here seven days. It doesn't mean it is seven days, but we just put it there as something that relates to to December 25th, 2021, right? So he's going to give them seven days. It's the seven days of the feast. So the message that comes there, December 25th, 2021, um, we have a number of things happening on that date. So first, Stephen discovers the 777 years from 457, which of course is... The starting point is marked in that story of Ezra, um, and it's going to go to the Sunday law. So we can see the connection with the Sunday law there again, right? That's 321, March 7, 321. And, um, but we know Colin also presents his message. Now, his message is giving us light, um, and yet this light isn't being recognized. That is, even though the light is given through call and study, the movement chooses not to study it. That is, they're just going to accept what Colin concludes. And, and because we had studied, um, you know, we had examined the foundation of the message, I was able to recognize that what Colin was presenting was light, but that light needed to be studied in the context of what we had learned. I didn't know everything that, that that message had connected to it. I just knew that it was light and that that light was being resisted by the people that Colin was presenting it to. And I tried to support what Colin was doing. It was perceived as an attack. And people just wanted Colin to present his message without studying it. And, and they still have not studied it. Nobody has looked at Colin's message in, in those groups and compared it with what God had given us. So God had given us all of this light um, leading up to December 25th, 2021. But the movement isn't interested in that light. Because men love darkness rather than light because their deeds are evil. I'm not making a judgment about any particular person. I'm just saying it's a general principle. We don't want to receive light because it's going to show us our sins and we don't want to see them. Because we spent a great deal of time hiding them. <clears throat> so this is the arrival of the second angel's message. This is the riddle that is put forth. And remember... The Colin is focusing upon this riddle, right? Is he not? Revelation 17? Correct. Okay. So we can see that this is all related. 
But the riddle of Revelation 17 can't be perceived by Colin in their group because they hadn't studied out the understanding of Revelation 17 in Millerite history. They hadn't understood how the Millerites came to their conclusions. It's fine to say that you're using Miller's rules because that's what Colin tried to argue. But I argued that he wasn't. And why was he not using Miller's rules? What was the reason that he wasn't using Miller's rules? Why was he misapplying them? Why could he not understand the riddle of Revelation 17, uh, verse 9 to um, 11, or I guess till 13, 14, whatever it is, whichever verse you say the riddle ends. But it's going to start there. And here's a mind that hath wisdom, which hath wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sitteth. There are seven kings, five are fallen. One is, the other is not yet come. And when he cometh, he must, must continue a short space, right? So one of the things the movement had done is God had given us some information regarding Revelation 17 of how to understand it. But did we understand how the pioneers understood Revelation 17? No. no. And we know in order to understand the present, we have to understand the past. So what, so what we did is we looked, we did a series of studies on the presidents of the United States. We looked at Colin's study and we recognized that there was things that we had never addressed before. That is, we had never addressed the pioneers' understanding of Revelation 17. And especially after 1844, especially in connection with the 1850 chart because that's addressed on the 1850 chart. Not, not directly, but indirectly, because they're addressing something there, dealing with Revelation 13. And their understanding Revelation 13 is connected to Revelation 17. So you have the beast there on the chart. So when you look at the 1850 chart, you're gonna have all of these beasts and those beasts need to be understood in the context of how the pioneers understood them. doesn't mean the pioneers were correct because they're going to make some mistakes in their understanding, but we need to recognize their understanding if we're going to understand what God had given us. Cause God had given us an interpretation of revelation 17 that we don't set aside, but we didn't realize it was an application Right. So we made an application and we have to recognize how that application is to be used. And I still don't think we fully understand it um, as a movement that we haven't understood Daniel chapter 11 in connection with Revelation 17. And Colin proposed that. So that's going to be there on December 25th, 2021. And we know that seven weeks later, Odilio is going to make a presentation. And that's going to be addressed um, in um, chapter 15 of Judges. So in Judges 15, because um, this is really con continuation of this story, but it came to pass within a while after in the time of wheat harvest. So we recognize that the wheat harvest, that this is referring to uh, Pentecost, that Samson visited his wife with a kid, and he said, I will go into my wife into the chamber, but her father would not suffer him to go in. For her father said, I verily thought that thou utterly hated her, and therefore I gave her to thy companion. Is not her younger sister fairer than she? Take her, I pray thee, instead of her. And Samson said, concerning them, now shall I be more blameless than the Philistines, though I do them a displeasure? And Samson went and caught 300 foxes and took firebrands and turned tail to tail 
and put a firebrand um, in the midst between two tails. And when he had set the brands on fire, he let them go in the standing corn of the Philistines and burnt up both the shocks and also the standing corn and the vineyards and olives. Right. So we know that there's this story of the 300 foxes and we address this in, in these lines. Um, let's see if I can find that. And Stephen addressed it as well. Where is this diagram? Um, must be earlier that we did this. Yeah. So we took this and drew it on a line uh, somewhere. There's the wave offering. Okay, so that's Manoa. Hmm. I don't see the diagram I'm looking for. Here we got the judges 15, the lion and the honey. Just going to search. Here it is. <clears throat> so here we have the first fruits. So we have these two loaves. These are going to be. Uh, these two studies, this is Colin study and Odilio study. And then we put the wheat harvest, January 11th, 2023, or December 25th, 2022. It's sort of connected to these two symbols. These are both the first day of the 10th month. And we mark this as the wheat harvest. And... We took this 30 plus 30 plus 30 times, so that's going to be 90 times 29.53 is going to give us 2658. And that's from December 5th, 2022. We have 2,658 days to April 5th, 2030. And if we count from January 11th, 2023, 30 times 88 months, so instead of 90 months times 29.53, it's 30 times 88 months. You get 2640, and from January 11th to April 5th, 2030, is 2,640 days. So what is this message of the 300 foxes? How do we then understand this in the line of Samson? So we don't really have it drawn in per se, right? We have 15, one to three is descent, um, that is, oops. I don't know why it should be December. Okay, February 12th, so that's your seven weeks. And we're gonna say that that is, uh, this offering, right? He's going to come with this uh, wife of the kid, uh, visit his wife with the kid. So this is this offering that he's giving. And we're connecting this to uh, the wheat harvest, Pentecost, right? And then uh, verse four and five, that's going to be uh, the 24th day of the 11th month in 2022. So that's going to be November 24th. We have there the 688. That's what we put as the empowerment. And then we're going to have uh, this uh, December 
2022 and January 11th, um, 2023, both symbolizing the first day of the 10th month. So in this line of Samson, we have this second message that arrives, and then we're going to have this third message that arrives. And the third message arrives on December 25th, 2022, and connected with the end of Colin's prediction. So that's going to be the divorcement of the strange wives. So we're going to have to come back to this tomorrow, but... So we consider this second message. So the first message was the message related to the fact that we had time in this movement. The darkness was that lack of understanding of time. But this is a message that is going to have honey attached to it, but also a bitter experience. It's going to be the end of FFA. And then we have a second message arrive. So we haven't really defined what that is. We've said what it is in the sense of it's Colin's message. It's um, this invitation made to the movement. It's Stephen's study. But we have to really define what that second angel's message is. What is the message that uh, is given at that time that has to be accepted in this period of time? That when the third message arrives on January 11th, 2023, that you can't receive that message if you hadn't received this other message. And it's really a one year period of time where we have these, the people have this opportunity to accept this second message. Okay. So we'll come back to that tomorrow. And again, we just have, um, Basically, another uh, week uh, till the end of this study. So as we're finishing this on, on the 12th um, until camp meeting, we'll pick it up again in reviewing it all. But uh, so we've got Wednesday and Thursday this week, and then Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday next week that we're studying this in the morning studies. So we still have a lot to go through to finish up these lines. So we'll try to finish up this line tomorrow and then look at Samson and Delilah. Any questions before we close with prayer? We need to remember to keep each other in prayer, keep the camp meeting in prayer. We know we prayed for Brother Toby. There's others who are interested in what's happening in this movement. And um, and then there's a lot of work still for me to do here and getting notes ready. So I need your prayer and help with that. And it's hard because I just moved. So trying to get everything organized so that I can actually function takes a little bit of time. It's nice to have a break. Um, but getting back to work sometimes is hard when you don't have a regular routine. So I need your prayers. And we all, well, we all need one another's prayers. Okay, so uh, let's close in prayer. Dear Father in heaven, please be with each person uh, throughout this day. And um, may your angels watch over us. We pray for those planning to come to the camp meeting. We ask that your angels can guide them that any hindrances that exist can be removed. People who are seeking to get visa approval, that your angels can intervene where Satan is seeking to hinder. And Lord, we give our hearts to you. We ask that you can use us. Continue to teach us according to thy word and um, bring us together again uh, to study these things. We pray and ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.